After almost a year and a half of brutal fighting, Ukraine's efforts to push back the invading Russian forces are now suspected to include drone attacks that have even penetrated the Russian capital itself. But is there a bigger spring offensive in the offing? And how steadfast are Ukraine's Western allies still? Let's ask, in our nation's capital, Andrew Rasoulis, fellow with the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, who served in a variety of roles over almost three decades in the Canadian Department of National Defense. And Jeff Sahadeo, director of the Institute of European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at Carleton University. In London, Ontario, Erica Simpson, associate professor of international relations at Western University and the president of the Canadian Peace Research Association. And here in our studio, Janice Stein, the Bellsburg Professor of Conflict Management and founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Janice, as always, great to see you again. And to our friends in Points Beyond, we appreciate your joining us on TVO tonight. Let's start with this. Janice, how is, to the best of your knowledge, Ukraine's resistance holding up? It, it's remarkable um, how well and how long it has held up. Uh, we are on the verge of what the Ukrainians are describing as a counteroffensive. But what's interesting, Steve, is Ukrainians themselves are now trying to manage expectations. What does that mean? Which means uh, that some of them uh, are worried that this counteroffensive has been overhyped. They are facing Russian forces that are dug in with trenches and barbed wire fortification, reminiscent almost to World War I. So they are trying to manage expectations uh, and reduce the hope that this will be the breakthrough that will push Russian forces back to the line. Jeff, let's do a little uh, sort of um, state of facts on the ground right now. How much of pre-2014 Ukraine is now controlled by Russia, to the best of your knowledge? Well, Russia is controlling parts of the four provinces that they claim to have annexed um, in the fall of 2022. So the Zaporozhye area, uh, Donetsk, uh, Luhansk, um, and they've, they've moved their lines forward, uh, but it's really been static within the last, uh, since really the summer offensive uh, that the Russians had. And of course, Ukraine pushed uh, Russia out of Kherson in the south uh, and have pushed Russia back uh, in the northeast as well. So as Janice was saying, the front lines have relied largely static. Russia's controlling a good chunk of Ukrainian territory, a good chunk of Ukrainian resources, maybe about a quarter of it. Um, but really, uh, neither side is satisfied with the status quo right now, which is why this war uh, continues to drag on. Let's admit that there's a lot of fog of war that we're all trying to wade through here because uh, no one can be 100% certain about necessarily anything here. But Andrew, from what you can gauge, is Russia yet feeling the fatigue of this war? Well, they're dealing with it. Uh, and the attacks on Moscow certainly are not helping the Russian situation. Uh, Putin is trying to keep a cool, calm look on it, calling it a counter-terrorist operation. But uh, the Russian people themselves, I mean, they may have been shaken up in Moscow, but on the whole, they remain committed to the war as long as it doesn't really affect them very much. So the Russia, we should not expect the Russians to break anytime soon. In fact, you can argue that over time, if they maintain their defensive positions, as Janice has described, very strong, then the Russian will be able to contain, sustain the war into 2024. The question is, can the Ukrainians do that? And that's really the debate between the attritional warfare here. Well, that takes me to a question for Erica, which is, in your judgment, how much of a difference have Western sanctions and Western weapons deliveries to Ukraine made in this war so far? Well, I'm going to emphasize that the Russians, in reply to Janice's comment about managing as we move toward the negotiation table, so we're in the pre-negotiation, what we have to recognize is the Russians have already lost more than 200,000 casualties. They've had desertions. They have lost, the Wagner group lost 20,000 out of 50,000 people in Bakhmut. So they're casualties are high or way higher than they expected. They went into Kyiv, into Ukraine with 120 forces. They've now lost more than 200,000 people. 
And so we've got to factor that in, in addition to the munitions and the supplies, the F-35s, the fighter jets that the Poles are giving, the Leopards that the Germans and the Canadians are giving. The NATO allies have really united here very strongly. And I think that the Russians did not ever expect this kind of unity and alliance coherence. Janice, those are astonishingly big numbers, but on the other hand, Russia is a lot bigger than Ukraine. Can they therefore sustain these losses more in a more long-lasting way? I think that's the really big question. Roughly three times uh, the size of Ukraine, but Ukraine is a very big country. And the Russian army, certainly the army that uh, Putin had mobilized, never had the capacity. Uh, to execute on the battle plan. He, I mean, the most charitable interpretation, he was misled by his own generals who were afraid to tell him the truth. That fog of war, as you put it, Steve, has dissipated. And the reason this counteroffensive matters so much, I don't think we should look at it only in terms of the amount of territory that Ukraine can take back. How well should we look at it? How how many Russian troops (laughs) are left standing at the end of this, because then Vladimir Putin will be confronted with a very tough decision to see order a second wave of mobilization. And there are interesting polls in Russia about Russian support. You know, all of us would admit it's really hard to do good public opinion sampling, but the more independent pollsters in Moscow, what they're showing is what we would call thin support. They're not showing opposition, but the support is thin. And another large mobilization of the kind that Putin was forced to do last September is not something I suspect that he wants to do. Andrew, let's pick up the story with the spring offensive, so-called, that Ukraine is uh, apparently planning. Uh, Again, no one knows for sure, but um, if, if you were a general looking at the battlefield, how would you see that playing out over the next several weeks and or months? Well, from the Ukrainian point of view, their weakest spot is is people power. Uh, The West can supply them weapons, and they are supplying uh, all the weapons the Ukraine more or less needs. However, they are not going to supply people because NATO is not going to go to war with Russia. So the Ukrainians have a diminishing pool of people that they can put into the fight. And this upcoming offensive This is a deliberate offensive being planned by Ukraine against a deliberate Russian defense. And we have not seen this in the war as yet, where both sides are fully prepared, fully determined, and casualties should be expected to be quite high. The Russians are fortified. So if if you're a Ukrainian general, you're looking at this, how do I attack minimizing my casualties at the same time, knowing that I will not achieve the strategic objective of Ukraine, which is to push the Russians back to the 1991 borders, including Crimea. Now, that puts the Ukraine into an everlasting war, almost a war, a renewed offensive in the fall, perhaps, after suffering significant casualties and pressure from the West and others that maybe it's time to look at a ceasefire, which the Ukrainians desperately do not want to look at a ceasefire. So alternatively, Ukrainians might be looking at new ways of attacking, not a large scale offensive, but small probing offensives that bite away at the Russian lines without the Ukrainians sustaining heavy casualties. The drone attacks, these attacks in in, in Belgorod and so on, are part of wearing down the Russians. So that's That could be a new, innovative way that the Ukrainians are doing, because in a classic way, they're going to hit the Russian line, try to punch through, threaten Crimea in your Kershaw, and sustain heavy casualties, and be forced to examine a prospect of a ceasefire or keep fighting in 2024. Hmm. Jeff, can you pick up on that? How do you see a potential spring offensive playing out? Yeah, I would would agree with Andrew completely on this. And for all the losses of manpower that Russia has, has had, Ukraine suffers more uh, when it's one to one or even two to one situations, and of course, when you once you have an offensive, uh, the offensive forces uh, confronting a forces dug in are generally expected to lose more in terms of human casualties. So I think this is why we have seen uh, continued delay in the offensive, uh, this managing of expectations that Janice mentioned, uh, this effort to have these missile strikes around Belgorod potentially uh, in Moscow, and just as Moscow is itself hitting Kiev with a 
with missiles trying to wear down the Ukrainian defenses and trying to wear down uh, Ukrainian anti-aircraft, trying to force them to defend a broader scope of territory as well. So we're going to see moves and counter moves in the next two months, more like Andrew described, rather than one of these massive def um, offensives that we saw in the fall, where Ukraine was able to punch through the Russian lines because of the fortifications are just too tight right now in Ukraine has to watch every man so carefully. Yeah, Erica, maybe you could pick up on that in as much as if, if there's an understanding in Ukraine that a sort of typical massive spring offensive isn't going to achieve the strategic objectives that one would expect, I don't mean this question to sound naive, but is there any point in doing it then? Well, I mean, I think if I was a Ukrainian general, I would be very concerned about the winter, the coming winter, because Russian tanks are more maneuverable in the winter. And so I'd be wanting this counteroffensive to succeed. But at the same time, I think it's very true to say that this is really an international campaign where Zelensky has to travel internationally and try to get support. And so they need to sound as if they're going to have a success. And frankly, whatever happens can be interpreted as a success by the West. And that's the problem, is we will never actually really know. Just like in Afghanistan, where we were constantly told that, oh, the, the Afghan National Security Forces have captured 51% of the country, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the end, we found out, no, no, no. So what I'm saying is, it is it's kind of the media. It's kind of a, a, a situation where we in the West want them to win, but we won't really ever know. And this war could drag on for years and years. The only thing I think that could happen would be that Putin dies, He's in a cocoon. He's not seeing anyone. They have to wait up for a week to see him. Maybe if he dies or he retires early somehow, then that might change how we get to the table. But we've got to get to the table. And so I don't think the number of deaths is important. It's whether what Putin does. I'd like to hear what Janice thinks about that. OK, we're going to find that out right now. Um, I, look, look, I'm, I'm agreeing with everybody here that this, this offensive, however it unfolds, and I tend to think it will be, and they're telegraphing this, um, the Ukrainians are, it'll be a series of smaller ones rather than roll the dice on one big one. Mm -hmm. You know, when, they, when the Ukrainians broke through last year, and it's very important that people understand that in the West, the Russians they had not had time to do what they've done now, which is to prepare, dig in, and fortify. So it's going to be much, much more expensive in lives and casualties. So I think the, the Ukrainians are, are well aware of that. Where I'm less optimistic a little bit than, than Erica is about the timing of getting to the table. You know, Russia has a track record of freezing conflicts and never going to the table. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't think we can rule that out. Um, and I think it's very interesting. There is an idea being discussed now quietly among NATO members, which in some sense is the biggest roll of the dice that you can imagine. Uh, but there, there is an interior logic to it. There is no going to the table with Putin. And hoping that Putin dies is not a strategy. Let me just put it to you that way. It's a wish, way. but it's not a strategy. It's a wish, it's not a strategy. <laughs> so there is discussion. This is coming up actually in the quarters of NATO at the Vilnius meeting. Admit Ukraine to NATO. And what are they invoking? It's really, really interesting. They are invoking West and East Germany. West Germany was admitted to NATO. It was a divided country. Admit what Ukraine to NATO because only by escalating the risk will um, you will be able to force Russia to stop fighting because then it is an attack against NATO. It's not against Ukraine. Let's get some feedback on that. Hugely Jeff, uh, risky. Hugely okay, risky. Risky strategy. Jeff, would you recommend it? <laughs> That's a risky strategy. I just don't see Turkey going for it, for example, um, which is going to be, if you need unanimous NATO approval, I can't see them getting every country in. I can see the, the thought of taking a risk because what's happening now is the West is supplying just enough to allow Ukraine to continue the war in sort of the static fashion, but not enough to win it. So maybe you have to take a risk somewhere. Um, but in this case, I think the risk is that you try it and then it just doesn't work. Um, you know, I would say rather than Putin dying, the, the, the biggest risk to this all, or it might get them to the table in, in a different way, is if, say, we see President Trump in 2024, right? Or, or a real change in Germany or in the United States or one of these Western countries, 
where you see this fatigue. And already you see it in some of these Western countries with, uh, even in Poland, for example, when they are trying to restrict Ukrainian grain exports. So the Western, polit because Western regimes have to respond in a democratic fashion, and there's a limited amount of, of pain that Western consumers and Western public is going to take. So where do you take the risk? Uh, and, and it's a, a series of not very good choices for the West. And, and this is one of the not very good choices. Hmm. Andrew, I'm going to ask you a completely facetious question, which is, I heard Donald Trump say on his CNN town hall that if he were elected president in 2024, <laughs> he could end this war in 24 hours. So should we all be praying for a Trump victory to see that happen? Well, it depends if you're not if you're Ukrainian, because the Trump's uh, peace solution is essentially a, an immediate ceasefire, uh, stop the supplies of uh, ammunitions and equipment to Ukraine, which then forces them to agree to a ceasefire, and the Russians get to keep everything they're holding. So that's how you bring it about in 24 hours, more or less. Gotcha. Let me ask you a follow up, which is it, it is a bit of a strange war in as much as the Western allies have been really asking Ukraine to fight with one hand tied behind their back the whole time, in as much as they're not allowed really to attack Russia. With, them, with NATO supplied equipment. With NATO they supplied are with equipment. with their own. <laughs> okay. Does that, I mean, how problematic is all of that to getting this thing to the finish line? Well, the, the problem is always when you're fighting in a nuclear environment, uh, there are, there's inherent limitations. The Americans, when they fought in Vietnam, uh, North Vietnam was not a nuclear power, but it was supported by a nuclear power of the Soviets and so on. So, the, And the Americans had self-imposed uh, restrictions in how they conducted the Vietnam War in terms of bombing and so on. And Korea was the same thing. You know, MacArthur wanted to go into China, so but they couldn't do these things. So the fact that there are limitations is quite natural when you're talking about a nuclear power. And if you're going to fight a conventional war... You have to fight it underneath the nuclear threshold, since there's no logic engaging in nuclear weapons. And that brings about inherent limitations, where you don't put the nuclear holding power, in this case Russia, in a position where it says, OK, I'm existentially threatened, and I'm going to start making all sorts of nuclear plays against you. So the, the fact that there are limitations is actually quite normal and is part of how you negotiate in that environment. Korea was negotiated after two years of stalemate where the Americans of the United Nations Command knew there was only a certain limit that they could do. And at the end of the day, they had to saw off. Nobody liked the 53 armistice, and there's been no political deal. There's no end to that war. We may have the situation in Ukraine and Russia, where we may get eventually a ceasefire because people get exhausted, but there will be no political agreement on, um, on giving away that land to Russia that they're going to hold. All right. Having said that, Erica, can you imagine a set of circumstances where Ukraine disregards the admonition that it currently fights under, which is no attacks on Russian soil with NATO weapons. Can you imagine that happening? I certainly can because of the drone attacks on the Russian, the richest areas of Russia where the elite live. So as soon as that happened a few days ago where uh, eight drones were sent, I thought, well, if they're foolish enough to attack the Crimean Peninsula, which is where Russia's Black Sea fleet is located, if they're foolish enough to think that they can retake the Crimean Peninsula, then we're entering a whole new gray zone of warfare. So Andrew was talking about the threshold, the nuclear threshold, uh, the Article 5 threshold, where an attack against one of us is an attack against us all. I'd be very concerned that Ukraine will never be able to become a NATO ally simply because of the worry that Ukraine would do something like this, would unwisely attack Russia using perhaps fighter jets from Poland and thus causing a, a, a conflagration in a war. So my main, my main kind of solace is that I don't think, like Janice thinks, that NATO will accept Ukraine. They'll talk about it. They've talked about it for years. They've dangled membership. Right. They've said you can be a partner but not an ally. And behind the scenes, they've been very clear that Ukraine will not be a NATO ally if Sweden cannot be a NATO ally with Erdogan at the helm, he's at the helm again. You will never get Ukraine. They will never have a consensus. So that's a pipe dream. And that's a way of deluding Western democracies into thinking that maybe NATO will protect Ukraine. No, they're on it. They're, they're in it alone with tons and billions of dollars of equipment, but they're in it alone. Uh, so that is why I, um, I am concerned. 
Janice, I want to follow up on this uh, drone attack again. What did you think about the advisability of Ukraine using drones to attack deep inside Russia? Uh, look, there's a Ukrainian calculus and there's a NATO calculus. They're not the same. Right? There was not 100% convergence, which is something that people don't like to talk about. Uh, but Erica's really just put it on the table. The drones that were used in that attack um, uh, on Moscow were Ukrainian-made drones. They were not NATO weapons. So they haven't violated any they agreements not. with NATO. And, uh, you know, there is very clear there's been a conversation back and forth. I do not believe that the Ukrainians would use any NATO supply weaponry to attack, um, or certainly over the, the February 24th line. Crimea, that's a, that's a whole other subject. And the reason for that, Steve, were that to happen, that would put uh, a chill on the willingness of NATO members to supply equipment, any equipment that can be considered uh, for offensive use, and that would be a huge liability for Ukraine. And Zelensky, Zelensky will not I risk that. I do not believe that Zelensky would ever okay. take that risk. It's, it, it's just such a terrible blow. Well, I, I for think, Ukraine. Andrew, let me bring you in on this. You know, I, I guess a lot of observers have been surprised at how reasonably well um, the Western allies have steadfastly stuck with Ukraine to this juncture. I mean, not a lot of the world has not, but a lot of Western allies have. I wonder, as you look at this, make the calculus. What would it take for Western allies to lose the political will they have so far demonstrated in sticking with Ukraine? Well, the popular narrative on that is that if the war grinds on, as it very well might, um, and you, you get to this uh, thing in 2023, uh, there's a pressure for peace negotiate, for ceasefire, not peace negotiate, ceasefire. And let's say the Ukrainians reject it. And they continue to say, no, nope, we're going to keep going. And the Russians manage to sustain themselves, despite perhaps losing some territory. But they can do a counterattack, and the war grinds. And so, to use that term, it becomes, to many people, a forever war. And then you've got the pressure of the American election, uh, with Republicans, uh, you know, DeSantis and, and, uh, and Trump both saying they would reconsider their options. And I think at that point, uh, the, the, the public may wane in certain countries. In Italy, it's down to 30 uh, percent of support for, uh, for Ukraine. So I think this is not to be assumed that the West support will be indefinite under all circumstances. I think there may be an expectation for some kind of a ceasefire agreement at some point in time. And the Ukrainians will be resisting that, and that's going to be an interesting calculus. Hmm. Janice, but the, the Italian prime minister has been absolutely steadfast in her support for Zelensky. But yeah. what do you see as yeah. concerns on the horizon on that front? Yeah, you know, she has, uh, Maloney, but because she was retreating from a campaign, Steve, <laughs> and then she became prime minister. And you know, prime ministers talk differently <laughs> when they're prime ministers than they do when uh, they're campaigning. She hugged Zelensky and said, we're with you to the end. You know, yeah. she, was, she was very firm I'm very dubious about the length of support, um, especially, as Andrew just said, if we are in a war of attrition um, that she, and, and a stalemated front line, which could conceivably be. And where will it crack first? The obvious one? Unbelievable as it is, the United States in 2024, which is not far. If there's a change in president. If there's a change in president. And I, I just imagine there is no supply of equipment here without the United States, frankly. Mm. Right? It's, it's provided, depending on how you count, something like 80% of what Ukraine has gotten. The Germans are under the surface not happy, not happy. They, they are looking for a way. You, you know, there are articles in European press. Um, what do we do to make the Germans stand up? I mean, that's fundamentally it. France, we have a uniquely idiosyncratic, gallist President Macron, uh, who doesn't think that it's appropriate to have a forever war. So who are we talking about? Italy, Germany, France, the United States, where there are conceivable timelines here. When we listen to the East European, the Baltic, Central European leaders, um, we get one message, when you move west, the further away you are from the battlefield and the Russian army, you're getting very different messages. There are cracks here uh, beneath the surface. Jeff, is one of those cracks Canada, or how steadfast have we been? Oh, no. <laughs> I, I think Canada is probably one of the most steadfast countries, and it's very difficult to imagine. <laughs> we would be anything but the last domino to fall in this situation. I agree. Uh, because of the large Ukrainian diaspora that we have here, our traditional support um, for Ukraine, 
uh, President uh, Prime Minister Trudeau is <clears throat> is not necessarily ensconced in power in the next couple of years, but we haven't heard uh, much even on the from Poliev or any politicization of Ukrainian aid. So I think Canada um, can be quite <clears throat> counted on as a steadfast ally. I mean, the, the main issue for Canada will be uh, once this conflict is over, and one of the tensions that's, ha that's happening now is Ukraine will be expecting men, the hundreds of thousands of, of Ukrainians who have come to Canada to return, um, whereas many of the Ukrainians who have come here to Canada have made themselves a life here, a life here and would like to stay. Um, so this is going to be a big question. Once there's a ceasefire, if there's a ceasefire, and wars do end, what happens to all these Ukrainians who are abroad now in Canada or elsewhere? How do you get them to come back to a country that's suffered so much devastation? And what will Western countries do about that? So that'll be an issue where Canada and Ukraine, I think there may be some some form of tension or negotiation. There. The other issue, just on, on you know, on Jeff's point, there's a second issue just looming over the horizon. Canada's been a strong financial supporter of Ukraine too. Um, done more, um, relatively speaking, than others. The needs are astronomical. And when and if there's a ceasefire, the discussion of a Marshall Plan for Ukraine, rebuilding Ukraine, um, how much um, will Canada do in an environment where, frankly, um, cash is not limitless, mm -hmm. that, then it's possible that it becomes a more politicized issue in this country. We've got about five minutes to go here. And Erica, let me bring you in on the issue of whether or not anybody knows if there are so-called back-channel talks or negotiations happening. Can you help us on that front? I am not a NATO official, and I do not know if there are back-channel. But I do think that if we look at the situation of Afghanistan, there were many back-channel discussions even after April uh, 2021 when they decided to withdraw. Um, I'm sure there's back-channel discussions about a Marshall Plan 2.0 as well that uh, has been proposed. But I, I myself do not know if there are any back-channel discussions about getting to the table and having a negotiation at a table, like at Doha, regarding Afghanistan. I have not heard anything myself. Andrew, what about you on that? Well, the Chinese are very active. Uh, they've been to Kyiv. They've been to Moscow. Um, so I think they're laying that path. Uh, for potential ceasefire when, they're, when the two warring sides are ready for it. They know they're not ready today, but the Chinese are laying the track. They're putting in a pathway. The Vatican has expressed interest. So these things are happening. And the Turks, of course, with the grain deal, they're always willing to make deals there as well. So the, I believe that the communication channels exist. The Chinese are a bit openly maneuvering to do that. Um, but the time is yet not right. But the Chinese, I think, and others are laying the groundwork for the day when it may be right. Jenna, should we be encouraged or nervous about the Chinese laying the groundwork for those back channels? Oh, no, I think we should be encouraged. I, I, I understand well why Zelensky may be alarmed, because the Chinese have certainly not adopted what we would call a neutral position. But I think keeping those channels of communication open is really important. Here's one back channel that we know is happening all the time between Moscow and Washington. There are, hmm. there are talks going on all the time and largely... At what level do you suppose? Oh, at the very senior most levels between... As in White House to Kremlin? Not White House to Kremlin, but uh, chiefs of defense staff to chiefs of defense staff. Hmm. There are conversations between intelligence to intelligence. Some of this, you could say, is what we call deconfliction. What do we do in the event of an emergency? And military leaders always talk to each other. But there's more there. Okay, let's finish up on this. I'm and Jeff, I'll go to you first on this. Uh, this is one of these real speculative questions where I ask, if you were advising Zelensky, would you urge him to keep going until he reconquers every square inch of his territory that Russia now holds? Or would you urge him to settle for something less and let's get this war over? I definitely would not encourage him to to try and push Russia back to the 1991 borders. I, I think, as we've talked about earlier, uh, Crimea is is a red line, and I don't think the international community would support him. Uh, I think he does have to start to manage expectations, and I think what's going to be critical is to try to stay out of what Andrew talked about before, which is a, the typical Russian tactic, which they've done in Georgia and Moldova, of, of nurturing a frozen conflict. 
that's in Russia's interest to kind of keep the, the, the pot kind of semi-boiling and Russia can turn up or down the temperature. So to have some kind of set uh, negotiation where there is a sort of set boundary, Ukraine may be have, having to give up territory, uh, maybe even past the 2014 border, but to stay out of this source and conflict and perhaps with this Marshall Plan 2.0, and maybe even at that point, some kind of NATO um, potential, if uh, Zelensky is willing to give this up. But the problem for Zelensky, I mean, it's, it's a problem for Putin too, but less of a problem, is this has become an existential battle for both regimes. And it's going to be very difficult to prime the Ukrainian public to make sacrifices um, territorially when they've fought so hard. So it's a very difficult situation. For I wish we had another half an hour for this group because that was a real smart conversation. I want to thank Andrew Rasoulis, Jeff Sahadeo, Erica Simpson, and Janice Stein for joining us on TVO tonight for a great conversation about this awful war. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.